When the Neo Geo AES home console was released to the public in 1991, it could be described in two words, impressive and expensive. Other home consoles spent the 90s promising to bring the arcade to consumers' homes, and while there were some impressive home ports, many of the best conversions those systems could deliver were still just close approximations. A lot of other companies talked about arcade quality conversions or arcade perfect conversions of games, but this was the real deal. I mean, you were literally bringing the arcade experience home. SNK's Neo Geo, on the other hand, brought truly perfect Neo Geo MVS arcade games to the home. But this level of quality came at a steep, steep cost. On release, the Neo Geo Gold System Bundle, which included two arcade quality joysticks and a game, would set you back $600 or more. And after that, you could look forward to paying around $200 or more per Neo Geo game cartridge. It was a premium home gaming experience at a premium price. But Neo Geo's home console legacy is much more than its high-end cost. The Neo Geo AES shipped with high-quality arcade joysticks. It was the first console to feature memory cards for game saves, which could even be used to continue a saved game at either the arcade or from the comfort of your own home. Neo Geo enjoyed 14 years of officially licensed games, a CD-ROM variant, and delivered an uncompromised arcade experience to the home that its contemporaries couldn't touch. From its origins as an arcade system, its transition from a Japan-exclusive rental unit to a home console, modern iterations, and the Hyper Neo Geo 64-bit follow-up, this is Neo Geo's story. The Neo Geo hardware was a product of Shin Nihon Kikaku, or as it's better known, SNK, a Japanese company founded by former arcade operator Aikichi Kawasaki in 1978. At the time, the Japanese coin-op industry was booming, and Kawasaki saw an opportunity to get his own piece of the gaming pie. With a high demand for new games already in place, all that the Osaka-based SNK needed to do was supply a product, as was evidenced by their first foray into arcades, 1978's Micon Kit, which was essentially not much more than a clone of Atari's hit game, Breakout. Over the next two years, SNK released seven more arcade titles, including what many consider their first true hit, 1981's Vanguard a side-scrolling shooter that's often cited as influencing other shoot-em-up classics such as Gradius. Vanguard was licensed to Centauri for North American distribution, where it outperformed SNK's projections. Bolstered by its financial success, SNK began to distribute Vanguard in North America for themselves, and a few years later, officially established SNK Corporation of America in California in 1986, with industry veteran Paul Jacobs at the helm as president. As the number of SNK's arcade titles rose, so did their profits. SNK spun off several of their arcade hits such as 1986's Ikari Warriors to home consoles and computers. SNK had become a player, both at the arcade and in the living room. As SNK approached the end of its first decade in the gaming industry, it found itself healthier than ever, both financially and creatively. SNK was even one of the five original NES licensees and created unique titles for the NES, such as 1989's Baseball Stars and 1990's Crystallis. Business was booming, and SNK's most ambitious project was just around the corner. On January 31st, 1990, SNK unveiled the Neo Geo MVS systems to Japanese arcade operators and distributors at the Tokyu Inn in Osaka, Japan. Two months later, SNK of America introduced the MVS to American arcade owners and distributors at the Acme Coin-Op convention that took place in Chicago from March 9th to March 11th. The Neo Geo MVS, which stands for Multi-Video System, was essentially SNK's magnum opus, an arcade cabinet that depending on the configuration was capable of holding up to six different games in its cartridge slots. Rather than buying multiple expensive cabinets for each SNK title, Arcade owners could buy one MVS cabinet and then simply purchase individual MVS game cartridges whenever SNK released new games. The MVS cartridges were much cheaper than purchasing an entire standard arcade cabinet. They took only minutes to change, and since Neo Geo's MVS could house multiple cartridges at once, the system also saved arcade operators on precious floor space. But the benefits didn't end there. For gamers, Neo Geo MVS machines featured headphone jacks and memory card slots that would allow players to save their games and continue where they left off once they returned. Later, these same memory cards could be used to continue a game at home 
on a Neo Geo AES. Our coin-operated machines use the POS system, which calculates the earnings of each machine and its software in seconds. For arcade owners, there were bookkeeping features that could store gameplay times, earnings information, settings, and more, with enough memory to store up to a year's worth of stats. SNK also included four games with every MVS during a special introductory period for the iconic black and red cabinet. It should be noted that SNK didn't develop the Neo Geo platform on their own. Much of the Neo Geo hardware was designed by Alpha Denshi employee Aiji Fukatsu and is an upgrade of their Alpha 68K arcade system from 1986. Alpha Denshi's name can even be seen on the schematics of various Neo Geo boards. Alpha Denshi, also known as ADK, was a video game developer that had a close relationship with SNK and would go on to develop many Neo Geo games, including the Neo Geo AES packing game Magician Lord. The first time I'd heard about Neo Geo was way back in 1990. When I was visiting the US for the first time, I was staying with my cousin and he was a big video game fan as well. And he had told me that there was a 7-Eleven down the street from his house that had this brand new four slot MVS SNK cabinet. I was immediately drawn to this machine and this game system. It was absolutely incredible just seeing these 2D, you know, zooming and scaling graphics that were really just showing you what this hardware was capable of. The Neo Geo MVS arcade cabinets were a hit, but they weren't alone. SNK had also created the Neo Geo AES. Originally in 1990, the Neo Geo AES was marketed as a home rental system, which effectively ended up being almost like a test market for the system. Due to demand, SNK began selling it directly to consumers on the home market soon after. The Neo Geo AES didn't just bring a near arcade-like experience to the home, it was the arcade experience. I think the biggest thing that set the Neo Geo apart from all other consoles of that era was you weren't playing a home port of an arcade game. If you were lucky enough to own an AES, you were playing the arcade game. That Pro Gear spec that you see on the startup screen means that it's real arcade hardware in your home. The AES was powered in part by a 16-bit, 68,000 family CPU. The 68K was at the heart of numerous computers and consoles such as the Sega Genesis, Philips CDI, Atari Jaguar, and many more. Neo Geo wasn't difficult to emulate in MAME because it used a Motorola 68000 and there wasn't really much protection in their games. Some games were protected, but most of them weren't, which means you could just pretty much just dump the ROMs. And then with something like MAME, you could get the games to work without too much difficulty. There was some work that needed to be done with mappers and some decryption later on in some games. Neo Geo was pretty easy to emulate. So a lot of my experiences with Neo Geo games was either playing them on emulators or even working on them when I was, you know, porting things like Final Burn to the Xbox and to other systems. Even though Neo Geo's 68,000 clock speed only ran about 50% faster than that of the Genesis, its graphical and other hardware capabilities left consoles of the time in the dust. Neo Geo hardware housed several other chips, such as a Zilog Z80 coprocessor for sound and a powerful custom chipset. Neo Geo's combination of hardware allowed for large sprites, scaling effects, and a 65,536 color palette with a maximum of 4,096 colors on screen at one time. SNK's dedication to bringing the arcade experience to the home wasn't limited to the console's internals. The joysticks bundled with the AES were large, 11 inches long behemoths that matched the MVS arcade cabinet joystick layout and quality. The MVS headphone jack was carried over, as well as the previously mentioned memory card slot. The Neo Geo memory cards could store approximately 20 games worth of saves and score data. Neo Geo's large ROM cartridge sizes, something it boasted about in its startup screen and game packaging, also allowed games to hold far more graphic and other game data than its competitors. Ironically, Neo Geo underestimated the 330 megabit maximum cart size it proudly displayed on startup as later games like 2003's King of Fighters would weigh in in the 700 megabit range. In short, the Neo Geo was a 2D powerhouse whose aggressive hardware specs would receive an equally aggressive marketing campaign. You 
wanted more power. Arcade-like four-dimensional graphics and 15-channel stereo sound. Neo Geo. There's no stopping us now. The AES was marketed towards the older, more hardcore gamer. Gamers who were willing to pay whatever it took to bring a true arcade experience home. I don't remember when I first heard about the Neo Geo, but I remember obsessing over it in magazines from a young age. Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm remembering things differently, but for me, the hype for the Neo Geo was massive. I stopped by some kid's house that I kind of knew, and he was so proud that he had just gotten a Neo Geo. It was a very expensive system to acquire. I mean, you had to be, you had to be rich in order to afford one. After he told me how much he paid for it, all I could think about was I'd spent all summer long just mowing lawns, raking leaves, doing everything I could to be able to buy both a Genesis and a Super Nintendo with a couple of games. And as hard as I'd worked to make that happen, I still spent less money than he'd spent on one console and one cartridge with one controller. I like to refer to the Neo Geo as an aspirational system because a lot of 90s kids would have liked to own one back then, but it was always out of reach. What I really remember about the Neo Geo, though, was naively filling out those sweepstake cards in gaming magazines, thinking that it was a realistic way of obtaining one. I also remember looking over the price list in the back of those magazines and realizing that if I did own the system, I would never be able to afford the games for it. Neo Geo's ad campaign featured provocative ads, double entendres, cold hard spec comparisons, and a healthy dose of 90s attitude. SNK's ads may have been over the top, but it's hard to argue that their message wasn't true. The system was marketed as a 24-bit console. Some people think maybe they just added together the 16 and 8 bits of the two processors, though the system did have a 24-bit graphics bus. Measuring a console's power in bits was kinda stupid, but SNK was looking for a way to differentiate the Neo Geo from the 16-bit consoles at the time. It's worth noting that Neo Geo's Japanese advertisements were just as out there and memorable. Aside from standalone TV and magazine ads, there were special several pages long advertisements for Neo Geo and its games that appeared in gaming magazines such as EGM. These inserts often featured Chad Okada, aka the Game Lord. Okada became a Neo Geo mascot slash spokesperson of sorts. Okada was even one of the featured interviews on an SNK special that aired on the now defunct G4 TV network. Although SNK never expected for the AES to move anywhere near the amount of units that Sega and Nintendo did with their much cheaper systems, that didn't mean that SNK didn't want to sell as many consoles as they possibly could. While SNK had built a nice catalog of fairly popular home and arcade titles, it lacked one major piece of the puzzle that its 16-bit rival seemingly had from the start, a system identifying game and mascot, something that was easily and readily identifiable with the Neo Geo. Nintendo had Mario, Sega had Sonic, and even the TurboGrafx-16 had its own iconic mascot in Bonk. Luckily for SNK, a revolutionary new game from a third-party developer would soon give them the opening they needed to fill their void. And in typical SNK fashion, it would be bigger and badder than just a game or a singular mascot. Neo Geo was about to take an entire game genre as its own. In April of 1991, the 90s arcade fighting game craze began with the release of Capcom's seminal Street Fighter II. Unless you were alive to experience it at the time, it's hard to truly grasp the massive impact that Street Fighter 2 had. It was everywhere. Grocery stores had Street Fighter 2 arcade cabinets, laundromats, gas stations, convenience stores, rec centers, and of course, arcades. Street Fighter 2 was the very definition of a smash hit, and SNK responded with a fighting game of their own when Fatal Fury King of Fighters was released seven months later in November of 1991. 
nearly simultaneously to both Neo Geo MVS arcade cabinets and the AES home console. While Street Fighter II fans would have to wait until the following year for downgraded ports to the SNES and Genesis, Neo Geo AES owners were able to play the exact same Fatal Fury they saw in arcades in the comfort of their own home. Fatal Fury, whose King of Fighters subtitle would go on to become the name of arguably SNK's most popular and well-known fighting franchise, was spearheaded by Takashi Nishiyama, the creator of the original 1987 Street Fighter game. Takashi saw Fatal Fury as the spiritual successor to Street Fighter, and while there are certainly some gameplay and visual similarities, it wasn't just a clone of Street Fighter. Fatal Fury offered several different game mechanics, such as being able to move characters into the background plane, a limited co-op fighting mode where when the second player joined the game in the midst of a one player vs CPU match, both human players would team up to take out the CPU before their player vs player bout began. Fatal Fury wasn't as big a hit or as well reviewed as Street Fighter 2, but Neo Geo had found its calling card with the general public, fighting games. Neo Geo's fighting games never rose to the level of popularity of the Street Fighter franchise, but they left an indelible mark on the genre, with features such as impressive sprite scaling when opponents fight in close quarters, weapon-based combat, and more. SNK and Capcom's fighting feud would continue throughout the 90s, leading to dozens of fighting games being developed for the Neo Geo. Eventually, Capcom and SNK's war culminated in the aptly named Capcom vs SNK and SNK vs Capcom series. For critics that dismissed Neo Geo's fighting games as Street Fighter II clones, there was Samurai Showdown, a blood and weapon filled game that featured an improved version of the scaling graphics first seen in Neo Geo's Art of Fighting. 1994 Samurai Showdown included numerous and varied attacks, combos, and a distinct, almost anime-like art style. Samurai Showdown was also one of the few Neo Geo games not to receive an arcade perfect port on the AES. North America's public hysteria over the blood and gore of Mortal Kombat resulted in SNK of Japan removing Samurai Showdown's fatal blows as well as the blood, which much like the SNES version of MK1, was replaced with Mist of Sweat. In 1994, SNK also released King of Fighters for its Neo Geo systems. King of Fighters allowed the player to choose a team of three fighters. When one of the team's fighters was knocked out, the next in line would take their place. This team play mechanic was unique and addictive. King of Fighters was a major critical and financial hit for Neo Geo, and SNK wisely took a page out of Capcom's book and released new King of Fighter games as quickly as they could. The history, depth, and variety of Neo Geo's fighting games could easily be its own long-form video, but Neo Geo was more than just a fighting game machine. Metal Slug. Amongst Neo Geo's other famous titles were Metal Slug, King of the Monsters, Magician Lord, Arrow Fighters 2, and more. And SNK weren't the only ones making Neo Geo games. Third-party titles with famous IPs such as Double Dragon and Bomberman were also brought over to Neo Geo. The criticism Neo Geo gets, I guess, is that there's too much fighting games, there's too much filler. But for me, you know, my favorite Neo Geo games, I would say that Metal Slug X is one of my favorites. Viewpoint is definitely another one. Viewpoint is a excellent isometric shooter that is just kind of underrated, but it's such a classic game to play. My favorite Neo Geo games tend to be the really obvious heavy hitters. The King of Fighters series, the first four Samurai Showdown titles, the real about Fatal Fury games. People may laugh, but I really like Ghost Lob. It's not an obvious choice because the game wasn't even officially released. But I'm not very good at puzzle games, and Ghost Lob just seems to get me. Some of Neo Geo's titles, particularly the fighting games, were ported over to other systems like the Super Nintendo. These ports were noticeably downgraded and weren't received nearly as well as Capcom's own 16-bit Street Fighter titles. For gamers that wanted a true SNK arcade experience at home, the Neo Geo AES was still the only option. However, as the general quality of 16-bit games improved, the high cost of Neo Geo's cartridges was becoming more and more difficult for some consumers to justify. Even 16-bit ports of coin-op games were inching closer and closer to their arcade counterparts. And games like Donkey Kong Country and Gunstar Heroes showed that there were plenty of impressive graphics to be found on the Genesis and Super Nintendo. Unfortunately for SNK, gamers were spending more and more of their dollars on 16-bit games instead of at arcades. Between the dwindling arcade market, 
upcoming next-gen consoles like the PlayStation, consumer trends rapidly shifting towards 3D gaming, and Neo Geo's small, niche home console market share. As the mid-90s approached, SNK's future didn't look quite as bright as it used to. SNK knew that they wouldn't be able to be competitive by continuing to sell new games for $200. They also understood that Neo Geo, though still a powerful 2D workhorse, would soon be perceived as outdated hardware by the public due to its inability to keep up in the burgeoning world of 3D gaming. But just like the characters it featured in many of its games, SNK wasn't going to go down without a fight and made plans to address both the cost of its cartridges and its future in an industry that would soon be ruled by polygons. The only question was, would it be enough? The Neo Geo CD was developed two years after the AES system had been brought home. The AES system was wonderful, even though it was expensive. The cartridges, which were basically $200 and then $250 costs, it was just restricted. SNK released the Neo Geo CD in Japan in September of 1994, and later in the US in January of 1996. In Japan, the Neo Geo CD was initially quite successful, selling out its first production run in just one day. The Neo Geo CD would chip with more traditional gamepads as opposed to the massive arcade-level joysticks that were bundled with the original AES console. Despite the long load times, the Neo Geo CD was basically identical hardware to the cartridge systems. And due to the lower cost of the games, the system was within reach for a wider market of gamers in Japan. The Neo Geo CD shipped with a slow, single-speed CD-ROM drive. It wasn't unusual for gamers to encounter numerous loading screens, sometimes lasting 30 to 60 seconds or more during their gameplay sessions. Well, I really love the MVS. I've become a diehard collector of the games for the Neo Geo CD. What I really love about the Neo Geo CD is that every disc contains a full Redbook audio soundtrack, meaning that I could put in Samurai Showdown RPG into my disc mint and enjoy the music, even if the language barrier keeps me from enjoying the game. Even the Neo Geo CD, which, you know, admittedly does have some limitations, particularly around loading speeds and things like that, but when the games are loaded, they play exactly the same way as they do on the arcade experience or on the AES. In December of 1995, SNK released the Neo Geo CD-Z, which had reduced load times thanks to its use of a double-speed CD-ROM drive. This model, however, was only released in Japan, meaning that other parts of the world were stuck with single-speed load times unless they imported a Japanese model. The Neo Geo CD received a few exclusive titles, such as the Samurai Spirits RPG, which was also only released in Japan. Unfortunately, the Neo Geo CD's load times and lack of 3D capabilities saw it receive unfavorable reviews in Western publications. By the time the Neo Geo CD was released in North America, the home console gaming landscape had changed significantly. No longer was Neo Geo only competing against the Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, and Super Nintendo. The 3DO had been available since 1993. The Sega Saturn had already been on store shelves for six months before the Neo Geo CD's release, and the Sony PlayStation had been available since September. Have you experienced the awesome power of the Panasonic Real 3DO system? With their cutting-edge 3D graphic capabilities, the 3DO, Saturn, and PlayStation were seen as more capable than the aging Neo Geo hardware. As if new consoles weren't enough to contend with, the Genesis and Super Nintendo were still going strong, with new titles being released each month. Heading into 1996, for Neo Geo home consoles, the writing was on the wall. By this point, King of Fighters was an established and successful franchise that had become an important component of SNK's bottom line. 1996 was also the year that the wildly successful run-and-gun Metal Slug series was introduced. King of Fighters and Metal Slug were helping to keep SNK afloat and relevant, but while SNK's arcade business was still doing well, it was a different story on the home console front. Due in large part to the decline of Neo Geo's home console business, SNK had little choice but to put less resources into it and instead focus more on its still profitable arcade division. AES and CD Neo Geo consoles all but disappeared from retail stores. Customers could still order AES games directly from SNK, but it took longer and longer for those orders to be filled. SNK of Japan scaled back their American operations, and though there was still an office in California, SNK of Japan was practically running the American branch's operations by the end of the year. 
the Neo Geo brand had taken some major hits and looked to be on its last legs, but SNK had one last Hail Mary left in its playbook. Towards the end of 1995, SNK announced the follow-up to their Neo Geo hardware, the Hyper Neo Geo 64. Initially slated for a late 1996 release, the long-awaited system wasn't seen in action until February of 1997 at the AOU show. But instead of dazzling attendees with an arcade cabinet worthy of carrying Neo Geo's name into the realm of 3D gaming, all SNK had to show was a videotape with less than a minute of footage from Samurai Showdown 64. The Hyper Neo Geo 64 was finally released September of 1997, but by then the hardware already looked outdated when compared to the more robust cabinets from Namco and others. In total, only 7 games were released for the Neo Geo 64 platform, and none were considered breakout hits or particularly well received. As you can imagine, no home console based on the Hyper Neo Geo 64 hardware was ever produced. In spite of the Hyper Neo Geo 64's lack of success, SNK decided to once again re-expand its offices in the US towards the end of 1997. Thanks to this renewed attention to the North American market, AES cartridges became easier to purchase and several SNK titles were released on other consoles such as the PlayStation. Unfortunately for SNK, this wouldn't lead to a full resurrection of the brand. As the 90s came to a close, business at arcades continued to dwindle, and while there was still a market for fighting games, their popularity was nowhere near the heights it had reached earlier in the decade. This was bad news for SNK a company who was primarily associated by many with fighting games. SNK stopped producing Neo Geo hardware in 1997, and their next big move was an entry into the portable market with 1998's Neo Geo Pocket, which was first only released in Japan and Europe, and then replaced with the backwards compatible Neo Geo Pocket Color in 1999, which did see a US release. Though it carried the Neo Geo name, as well as series made famous on the MVS AES hardware, this was its own separate product. The Neo Geo Pocket achieved a 2% market share in North America, and while the device itself turned a small profit, it wouldn't be enough to keep the company afloat. In 2000, SNK was bought out by Aruze, a company that specialized in pachinko games. Although SNK continued to release arcade and home console games in 2000 and 2001, SNK's legendary intellectual properties were now mostly serving as fodder for Aruze's pachinko machines. Aruze gave little support to SNK's video game development division, and the Neo Geo Pocket Color was discontinued in the US and Europe in mid-2000, with Japan following suit in 2001. Through all of this, SNK's financial situation continued to degrade. Prior to Aruze's purchase, SNK had signed a deal with Capcom that would allow the two companies to make games using each other's characters, Capcom vs SNK, and a sequel was released to the Dreamcast, PS2, and Arcade but since they were developed by Capcom, they earned most of the revenue, not SNK. SNK did release two of its own SNK vs Capcom games for the Neo Geo Pocket Color, but their sales did little to improve SNK's financial outlook. Unhappy with what had become of the company that he created, Akichi Kawasaki left SNK and along with five former SNK executives, formed Brezasoft. Aruze proceeded to close all SNK businesses outside of Japan, which only further exacerbated SNK's financial woes. Some Aruze shareholders filed a lawsuit that alleged the company's willful mismanagement was responsible for SNK's losses, which at this point had reached somewhere in the neighborhood of $258 million. This lawsuit, compounded with SNK's debt, led to Aruze placing the company into bankruptcy in 2001. But instead of being the end of SNK, its bankruptcy would be its rebirth. On the heels of their bankruptcy proceedings being finalized in October of 2001, SNK announced on their website that the company would be closing its doors. This should have been the end of SNK, but just two months prior, SNK's founder, Akichi Kawasaki, started up another new company named Playmore. Playmore successfully purchased the rights to most of SNK's intellectual property, then purchased Brezisoft, rehired many former SNK employees, and to jumpstart game development, bought Noise Factory. With part of SNK's old team having been reassembled, Playmore produced new products for Neo Geo Home and Arcade systems, as well as for other consoles such as the PlayStation and Dreamcast, and at 2003's E3, declared its plans to reintroduce MVS distribution in the US. On July 7, 2003, 
Playmore announced that they had acquired the rights to SNK's name from Aruze and was changing its name to SNK Playmore Corporation. Against all odds, SNK's rebirth was complete, but even so, the Neo Geo hardware would no longer be a part of the company's future. Although Neo Geo hardware production had ended sometime in 1997, SNK Playmore's last official game for the Neo Geo would be released in 2004 in the form of Samurai Showdown 5 Special, released for the Neo Geo MVS, bringing an impressive 14-year run of officially licensed games to its end. SNK Playmore continued to publish arcade games on Sammy Corporation's Atomus Waveboard, which was based on Sega's Naomi Arcade Board, which itself shared some of the same architecture as the Sega Dreamcast. SNK Playmore's titles for the Atomus Waveboard do feature characters associated with the Neo Geo brand, but these are not Neo Geo hardware games. In January of 2004, SNK Playmore announced that the company would shift their core business to, ironically, Pachinko Slot Machines. In 2012, SNK Playmore licensed Tomo to manufacture the Neo Geo X, a $200 portable device that came bundled with 20 built-in Neo Geo games with additional titles available for purchase on game cards. A Neo Geo X Gold Limited Edition with a joystick similar to the one that came with the original AES, as well as a docking station to charge and connect the device to a TV, was also available. It's important to note that the Neo Geo X was not a miniaturized Neo Geo. Instead, it used the FB Alpha emulator to play Neo Geo ROMs. The emulator and system both run on top of Linux. The gold bundle was only produced for a short period of time, and SNK seemed to have a rather messy breakup with Tama, though the Neo Geo X website is still online. In August of 2015, Chinese tech company purchased Kawasaki's controlling stake in SNK Playmore. With its new ownership and management, SNK Playmore announced that it would leave the pachinko market and concentrate on console and mobile games. In April of 2016, SNK Playmore changed its name back to simply SNK Corporation and also readopted their old slogan, The future is now. Further cementing a return to their roots, SNK released the King of Fighters 14 in August of 2016 to the PlayStation 4, PC, and Arcade. It was SNK's first King of Fighters title in nearly six years. Now this is all well and good for SNK, but what about the Neo Geo brand? In 2018, SNK released the Neo Geo Mini to somewhat mixed reviews. The Neo Geo Mini comes with 40 classic Neo Geo games preloaded into the system. It originally retailed for around $110, but they can easily be found at half the price now. In September of 2019, one of Neo Geo's best-known characters, Terry Bogard from the Fatal Fury series, was announced as a downloadable character for Nintendo's Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. As well as a stage based on the King of Fighters and music from other SNK series. As of the time of this video, early 2020, this is arguably one of SNK's most prolific Neo Geo-related contributions to gaming in recent memory. In 2007, SNK announced that it would no longer provide support such as maintenance and repairs for Neo Geo's hardware. But like many other consoles from the 80s and 90s, the Neo Geo continues to enjoy support from a loyal community of fans who are keeping both the MVS and AES very much alive. Since 2004's final officially licensed Neo Geo game, there have been a handful of homebrew titles developed. The Neo Geo community has produced mods ranging from consolizing the MVS, custom system BIOS, and improving the audio and video quality of AES consoles. Nothing about the Neo Geo was cheap, yet it is without a question the king of all home consoles when it comes to visual presentation. Eventually, I would have some disposable income, and when Analog announces Neo Geo CMBS, I knew it was time to make the purchase I had dreamt about for nearly three decades. Robo Army, Shock Troopers, and of course the iconic Metal Slug have become some of my favorites in addition to the many incredible SNK Sports titles. Yeah, sports. The Neo Geo is available in two variants, the MBS Arcade System and the AES Home System. Despite the two systems being incompatible with each other's cartridges, they're both functionally the same. AES home cartridges tend to be much more expensive on the used market today. Some games weren't even released in AES format. 
collecting for the Neo Geo can still be quite expensive. AES cartridges are generally more expensive than their MVS counterpart due to how common MVS cards are compared to the more rare AES cartridges. It's not uncommon to see AES games go for hundreds or even thousands of dollars, while MVS carts tend to stay in the more manageable sub $100 range. Thankfully, the Neo Geo community has stepped in with adapters and modifications to allow you to play Neo Geo MVS games at home, as well as EverDrive-like options, such as Terra Onion's Neo SD Pro AES. If you want a good Neo Geo experience, you don't have to spend a million bucks on it. Even now, these cartridges are very expensive, but if you just want to play the games, my first suggestion is always emulation. Even if you're into original hardware and playing in RGB on CRTs and stuff like that, you still don't have to spend a ton of money. If you want, you can get the arcade boards, the MVS versions MV1B and MV1C, and you can put together a kit that allows you to use that on a CRT television, or I guess through a scaler on a flat screen. And there's tons of different options available from just mounting the board to a piece of wood and then getting a very cheap board designed to get video output, video and audio out of it safely. Or you could go as far as making it look like an official Neo Geo console, but it's actually an arcade board inside. SNK may no longer support Neo Geo hardware, but that doesn't mean that they've forgotten about it. New games using IPs that are synonymous with the Neo Geo platform continue to be developed and ports of Neo Geo classics seem to find their way onto new hardware and modern platforms each year. Even to this day, 30 years after it was introduced, the name Neo Geo evokes a certain amount of reverence and respect from gamers. Where others promised an arcade experience at home but came up short, Neo Geo actually delivered without any compromises. I think that the Neo Geo just has that aura of hype and hugeness about it that really just brings that out. Even to this day when we talk about Neo Geo and new games being developed, there's always this excitement around it that it's something special that's coming out. The Neo Geo is one of the few pieces of hardware from the 90s era that still has a sense of mystique and mystery about it. I've yet to see a Neo Geo for sale at a gaming convention that didn't elicit oohs and ahs from people as they passed by it. Like they just stumbled upon a mythical creature, or maybe more accurately a dream from their childhood. Because while Sega and Nintendo may have ruled the gaming scene in the 90s, we all knew that the holy grail of console gaming was the Neo Geo. Hey everyone, I just want to give a few quick thank yous. First of all to Ethan Johnson from The History of How We Play. He was very helpful in providing some source material for this video. Uh, an extra special thanks to Neo Alec, who not only provided an interview and gameplay footage, but also lent some of his expertise throughout the making of the video. If you want to learn more about Neo Geo games, I recommend checking out his Neo Geo review playlist, which I will leave a link to in the description below, as well as to his channel Basement Brothers. I want to also thank Genovi for providing footage of his CDZ, as well as his wood grain CMVS and controller. I can't recommend Genovi's documentaries, definitive analysis series, and unreleased game series enough. Finally, we have Bob and MVG. Uh, these guys are practically legends in the retro gaming community at this point, so I'm sure you know who they are, but just in case, I'll leave a link below to RetroRGB.com as well as the RetroRGB YouTube channel and Modern Vintage Gamer's own YouTube channel. Highly recommend checking those out if you're not already. Finally, I wanna thank all of my Patreons. Uh, you guys have been great about supporting the channel and thanks to that support, I've been able to start implementing some of the 3D modeling and animation you saw in this video. If you want to support the channel monetarily, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wrestling with gaming. If you just want to keep up on what's going on with the channel, give me a follow on Twitter at wrestlesgaming. But most of all, thank you for watching.